check if we're on YouTube now. Okay, good morning, everyone. So it's 8 o'clock in the morning. So thank you once again for joining us in the Paasi webinars. So this is our uh, 20th lecture, not counting the lectures we had during the celebration of the Paasi anniversary. So this morning, we will talk about knowledge updating, decision making, and the search for truth through data. Our speaker is a professor of statistics at the University of South Carolina in Columbia, South Carolina. He is currently a program director in the Division of Mathematical Sciences of the Directorate of Mathematical and Physical Sciences at the National Science Foundation. He obtained his bachelor's and master's degrees in statistics from the University of the Philippines at Los Baños. And his PhD, his master's and PhD degrees in statistics from Florida State University. Prior to joining the University of South Carolina, he was a faculty member at UPLB, Bowling Green State University in Ohio, and the University of Michigan. He is an elected fellow of the American Statistical Association and an elected member of the International Statistical Institute. He is also currently serving as executive secretary of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. His research is in mathematical statistics, foundational issues of statistical inference and decision making, stochastic modeling and statistical analysis of time to event data and in the reliability of complex systems. So let the, I am happy to welcome Professor Ed Selpen. Okay, thank you, Kay. Uh, it's wonderful to give this talk. You know, Kay has been inviting me to give this talk, I think in May or June, and I was always finding reasons not to, to agree to it. So I said, because there's the policy conference that uh, we had for one month in July to August. So I gave a talk to her for 12, 15 minutes or 20 minutes, and I thought I was off of the hook. I said, she will not invite me again. So I was very happy after the policy conference. And then uh, uh, I think a month ago, almost a month ago, it was my birthday. And Kay sent me an email and said, uh, wishing me happy birthday, okay? And uh, of course, I was very happy that uh, she greeted me a uh, nice happy birthday. And then her next email was something like, will you now give a talk in this uh, webinar? Now, uh, if she only realized that if you, whatever she would have requested me, I would have given to, to her during my birthday, she could have asked for $1,000 and I would agree in it. At least uh, she only asked me to give a talk. So uh, it's a big bargain for me in this, in this case. <laughs> but uh, it's my pleasure to give a talk. Uh, and uh, I, I was uh, mentioning earlier that it's always harder to present a talk for a general audience because uh, I have to minimize uh, certain things, but we'll see, okay? So the title of my talk is uh, a little bit uh, high sounding, okay? But, uh, I think this is very relevant these days. And uh, I, of course, I'd like to mention that uh, I'm dedicating this talk to Professor C. Harao. Uh, he had turned 100 uh, years old last week. And uh, he is one of the pillars in the statistical community. I think he is the, one of the top three statisticians that are still alive. And uh, he turned uh, 100 years old last week. and. Uh, I called him here, all knowledge is in final analysis history, all sciences are in the abstract mathematics, and then all judgments are in the rational statistics. It is in a book that he wrote entitled Statistics in Truth, okay? So, and, uh, and there he is, uh, that is his famous book that he is uh, holding. And uh, when I was in Bowling Green, Ohio, he actually visited us uh, uh, during the time. So now, uh, last uh, month also I mentioned during the past the conference that uh, it might be good for speakers to kind of tell a little bit about uh, where they came from, especially since we are all in different fields. Uh, some are engineers, some are chemists, physicists, and I thought I'll start that process then in some sense. So I put here an accidental statistician's continuing stochastic journey through life but only in pictures, okay, it is uh, just going to be quick. And uh, so this is where I came from, that uh, 
a island of Catandoanes that has that arrow there. That's a very small island in the Philippines. Uh, actually, the arrow is pointing to where I actually came in. This is the old church there. You know, in the Philippines, uh, it's a Catholic country. So we have many, many old churches from the Spanish colonization. And uh, that's the church there. And then uh, I remember the farmlands in my in my town. And you can see that uh, the farmlands. It's a nice uh, little town, not very many things there. But it's a very rural uh, town, so I, I have I wanted to show that uh, to you. Okay, so I think I pressed the wrong thing. And uh, this is the elementary school that I uh, attended uh, when I was in uh, in the Philippines. Uh, and this is the Panganiban Elementary School. It's an old one, and uh, I think this is actually newer now. And then from the from the from that town, I went to Philippine Science High School. I was very lucky to uh, get admitted here so for my high school. And I think several people in the audience are also from Philippine Science, and this is the buildings that we had there. And uh, from there, I went to Los Banos, UP Los Banos. So we have this beautiful uh, campus in Los Banos. Uh, I think that was my ideal campus, uh, and I enjoyed very much my stay in this uh, university. And from Los Banos, I, I, I was there for three years to get my bachelor's, and I got my master's, and I also taught at Los Banos. And I think Sita Albacia, who is in the audience, was actually a student in one of my classes during that time. Yeah. It has been a long, long time. So, and from there, I went to Florida State University, that's in Tallahassee. So this is the entrance for the university, OK? And, uh, and I had my first job in Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. This is actually the mathematics department. And that was me two years ago. I gave a talk there. So Marge took a picture of me in that building. I think my office is somewhere there. Yeah. And this is a tower in the in Bowling Green. I think Marcos Agustin, who is in the audience, is uh, uh was also in this university. Actually, he was a uh, uh, student there. Yeah. He was my student. Uh, Marcus was my student. Okay, so yeah, so so that's uh, Bowling Green. Then uh, I visited Michigan for two years. We lived in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, for five years while Marcus was a postdoc. So this is the University of Michigan, one of the buildings there. It's a big university, and uh, and I went to the University of South Carolina. So this is where I am now. This is the what you call as the horseshoe, uh, and. Uh, Every noon time when I could, I walk around here, and that's when I get a lot of uh, thinking done. Okay, so and uh, now I'm uh, I'll be in the National Science Foundation. So this is the National Science Foundation that's in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. I have an office there, but I haven't been to my office because of COVID. So I'm still working from South Carolina, but uh, somewhere there is my office. So this is the. National Science Foundation. So that's my journey so far. And uh, it's a random journey because uh, you really never know where you will end up. And I put this there because uh, for the younger people in the audience, just work hard. You never know where you will end up. Uh, like C.R. Rao, for instance, he worked for, I think, 30 years in India. And then after the 30 years, he retired and then went to the US and he became pro professor at Pittsburgh. And then, uh, Penn State, so, and then he published so many papers in India as well as in the US. So you never know. So just enjoy whatever you do, and then uh, you'll never know where you will end up. I think that's the essence of uh, my I presented this part there. Now, uh, before I start with the uh, uh, talk uh, per se, uh, we now had to put a disclaimer. If you're working for the government, you have to put a disclaimer. And the disclaimer is that uh, any opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed in this talk are those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. Of course, they support me. Uh, and then NIH also supported me uh, in the University of South Carolina. So these are my acknowledgement for the support, but this is a disclaimer that uh, we have to put in for every talk and paper that we publish if you are working for the government. And I think it's uh, just the right thing to, to do, okay? Now, so what's all the fast step, okay? What's uh, the talk about? And the talk about is about truth, okay? 
uh, if you see the newspapers, read the newspapers, uh, we're always talking about what's the truth of something. So it's a big, big thing, but we never know what it is or the, the intricacies of finding the truth, okay? And uh, I would say here that uh, one of the reasons of our existence is the search for truth. Of course, just surviving, but maybe the uh, more important reason is that we want to explain things, we want to gain knowledge, and so on. It's kind of our scientists' creeds, engineers' creed, in anybody actually to understand and to know the truth in nothing but the truth. Okay, and uh, there's a biblical saying that says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay, actually, I think that's in the CIA building, so on. Now, why do we want that? Because with good knowledge of the truth, we could make correct decisions. And decisions are important for our everyday living. Should you wear a mask? Should we use the hydroxyl chloroquine for COVID-19? All of those are important questions that we have to, to answer. And uh, with truth in understanding, man makes progress. But of course, if we do, if we use that knowledge properly, sometimes you also use it in a poor way and then disaster happens. Uh, it could improve the quality of our lives. Uh, we get better food, effective medicine, and living comforts. Now, last week, there was a big event in mathematics. Uh, uh, professor Sir Martin Heider, he's a professor at Imperial College in London. He won $3 million as uh, a break breakthrough in mathematics award. Uh, uh, the Zuckerbergs of Facebook, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, Breen of Google, and I think uh, Milner, uh, an Israeli guy, these are all billionaires. They set up this fund, and then they award $3 million to the winner of uh, 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 this prize uh, every year. And uh, Martin Hayter won it last week, uh, and uh, he was uh, he's being honored for contribution, stochastic analysis, and stochastic partial differential equations. A very complicated uh, subject because it deals with randomness. But in randomness, there is also structure and that was what uh, he was trying to do in his research. But uh, the reason I put it here is because of this quotation from him. Mathematics is true. Once you discover something in mathematics, it applies to all eternity. So mathematics is a different sense in that way because if you discover a theorem, if it is a correct theorem, nothing could disprove it. It will be true forever, whether we are all gone and so on and so forth. It might even be hold true in other parts of the universe in that case. So, so this is a very important quotation and uh, I, I put it there because of the idea of truth, absolute truth in that situation. Now, uh, there are actually, you could actually classify truths. And uh, one of the classification of truths is what we call as deterministic truth or absolute truth, okay? And uh, an example of a deterministic or absolute truth is that the square root of two is an irrational number. Now, uh, if, uh, some of you might have read about the Pythagoreans, okay? These are the uh, Greek uh, scholars during long, long time ago. And uh, they thought that every number uh, could be expressed as the ratio of two integers. Okay, so that, uh, that because that they thought that the integers are the building blocks and every other number is the ratio of two numbers. Those ratios are what we call as irrational number, uh, rational numbers. Now, you could imagine the situation during that time when one of their students uh, named Hippasus, uh, Hippasus came one morning, say, and said, oh, I'm able to show that the square root of two is not the ratio of two integers, okay? And uh, he is able to prove that you couldn't actually express the square root of two as the ratio of two integers. Now, this was a big event for the Pythagoreans because uh, everything crumbles for them because they thought that every number is actually the ratio of two integers. So that's why I call this as a deadly truth because I think the Pythagorean elders gathered and say, what are we going to do? And so what they simply did is uh, they tied Hephaestus to a stone and then they threw him out, out in the lake, in Jayan Lake, and uh, never to be seen again because they couldn't reveal that the square root of two is actually not a fraction, okay? But uh, it turns out, of course, that the 
fact that the square root of two is a rational, is an irrational number came out to be a very important one because that led to the discovery of calculus, limit operations, and so on and so forth. So it was deadly in the beginning, but it was actually the engine of progress later on. So, so that's a, but that is an absolute truth, and that's a mathematical truth in that case. The value of the speed of light in the theory of relativity, for instance, is also an absolute truth. It's denoted by C, okay? Of course, uh, the value that we had for this is an approximation, but uh, we have an absolute truth for the speed of light in a vacuum. Another kind of truth is, uh, let's say that you have a defendant. A defendant is accused of murdering somebody. Now, either the defendant is guilty or the defendant is not guilty. There's an absolute truth to the set, to the state of that dependent. We want to discover that, of course. So, so that's again, uh, uh, an absolute truth in this case. Whether hydroxyl chloroquine is better than a placebo is also for treating COVID-19 patients, at least say for at least six years old. That's another absolute truth that you would like to discover. And uh, putting it in contemporary times, you could say whether the president actually uttered the words losers and suckers about military people. It's either true or it is false, but only one of them is going to be true. That's again, an absolute truth and we would like to discover what the truth is. Uh, whether there are extensive natural gas reserves in the South China Sea, okay? So that's again, a truth that we would like to know because uh, if there is, then uh, maybe the different countries in Southeast Asia are very interested in controlling the South China Sea. Okay, so those are examples of what we would call as absolute truths. But at the same time, you also have what you call as probabilistic truths, okay? So a very simple example of this is if I, if I have a coin and I say this coin is fair, what do we mean by fair? Well, it simply means to us that uh, uh, if you flip this coin many, many times, then 50% of the time, it will land up heads, and then 50% of the time, it will land up tails. So this is kind of the idea of a fair distribution for this coin. While if it is a biased coin, then you will have a uh, different proportion for the uh, heads and then for the tails. Or you could say, uh, what is a fair die? A fair die, again, is the situation where if you keep repeating uh, throwing this die, you will get equal proportion of the occurrences of one to up to six, and then you will say it is a biased die if you have a different proportion than one six for, for this outcome. So, so, so here, uh, these are examples, so simple examples, but you could certainly relate it to situations in society where you might say, is it the case that uh, black defendants, for instance, in America, are getting worse treatment than say other race so so that you could convert it in this type of problem but uh, in uh, in our uh, studies we typically just uh, uh, connote this or denote this in terms of dice or uh, dice or coins uh, they could represent something much more okay so 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 that's the idea and in this situation where you had probabilistic truths uh you represent them in terms of what we call as probability distributions okay now other ones are deaths, okay? So you could ask, uh, what is the number of deaths due to COVID-19 by the end of this year? We do not know that, that's a random thing, but you could describe it according to some distribution. You might say that uh, uh, it might have an average number of 350,000, but there's a variation that is represented by this density, for instance, okay? Or you could ask, uh, what will be the temperature at the uh, Nino Aquino International Airport on noon time of January 1, 2021. Now, it's a random thing at this point, but maybe you could describe it according to some probability distribution. So again, these are probabilistic truths, okay? And other examples might be whether a gene is associated with a phenotype or a medical intervention, uh, the impact of medical intervention on the lifetime of patient. That's also, thanks. And, uh, but to me, I'm a chess player. So when I sit in front of my opponent, my mind says, what is his first move? Because there are basically several possibilities. And again, that's a probabilistic truth in that situation because it's a distribution that you are considering, okay? Now, how do we represent our knowledge of truth? 
Okay. Again, uh, unless you can prove things mathematically, or I put here, unless a dependent uh, confesses uh, his crime or non-crime, okay, you could never be 100% certain about your knowledge of the truth. So what usually happens is that our knowledge of the truth is represented by a probability distribution, okay, just like the representation of a probabilistic truth. Okay, so say so our, uh, our knowledge of the truth is uh, typically through a probability distribution over the space of possible truths. So if I give you a coin, for instance, I could ask you, what is your knowledge about whether this coin is fair or not? And then you look at the coin, you say, oh, it looks symmetric. Okay, but then you might say, I couldn't be certain that that's really 100% uh, uh, fair. So you might say maybe 95% fair, it may be 5% not fair. So in that situation, you put a probability distribution to the two possibilities in that case. Or if I ask you about your knowledge about the temperature at the, the airport on January 1 noon time, you might say that it's, it has a normal distribution with a certain mean in a certain standard deviation. So that could be your knowledge of the truth in that situation. And what we would like to do is to try to update that knowledge. Your initial knowledge will be maybe imprecise. So what you would like to do is to try to update that through the observation of data, okay? And uh, that's where I am headed here. But before that, I just wanted to mention that uh, when you're dealing with knowledge of truth or when you're dealing with probabilistic truths, then you have to use the language of probability. Probability is the language of uncertainty, okay? So, and uh, a very simple situation, of course, is flipping a coin. It could be heads or tails, and then there's a certain probability for heads or tails, okay? Or you could have more complicated random experiments. It leads to events like A and B here. Those are subsets of what we call a sample space. And then you can measure the degree of certainty or uncertainty associated with these events through this notion of probability, which are numbers between zero and one. Uh, the, the whole event, of course, the whole sample space has probability one, while an empty event has probability zero. And if you have two events that do not intersect, you call them mutually exclusive, then you should be able to adapt their probabilities to obtain the probability of either one of them occurring. Now, there's of course a question here of how you come up with the probabilities, okay? Or how do you interpret them? One way to interpret them is through the frequentist approach where you keep repeating the experiment and then you observe the proportion of times that an event is occurring. If you keep repeating that and you look at that proportion, it's going to stabilize and that stabilizing value is the probability. But there are certain situations where you couldn't repeat the experiment. One example, for instance, is the outcome of the election this coming November. There's only one experiment that will happen on November 3. But I could ask you, what do you think is the probability that Biden is going to beat Trump? Then the probability that you will give me, that is what you call a subjective probability. But then if I ask another person about that probability, he might end up with a different probability. That's why you call it a subjective because two different people could have two different assessments of that probability of that event. But however you assign the probabilities of events in a sample space, they must satisfy certain mathematical properties. And those are actually what we call as the Kolmogorov axioms properties. But uh, that's, uh, that's the technical aspect there. Now, when you have an experiment, you could convert its outcome here to a real number and then that is what you call as a random variable. And then that will induce also a probability of the possible values of this variable, okay? And uh, usually you could then say, what's the probability that this function takes value in C? Then you should be able to integrate a certain function over that C, which is the area under that curve to give you the probability. And then this function E sub x is what you call as the probability density function, or if you have a discrete case, that will be called the probability mass function. But uh, the theory of probability is very interesting, okay? Very difficult subject for a lot of students, but it's a beautiful subject and it's a very, very rich subject. For those of you who are not in 
mathematics, you should read a little bit about probability. This is a very nice subject, okay? Now, just to formalize a little bit, uh, random variables are usually called features now in machine learning or uh, uh, data science. Instead of calling them random variables, we typically would call them now as features, okay? And uh, you could have a random vector where you have two of them, or you could have three uh, uh, random variables and so on and so forth. The density has this interpretation that if you multiply a density by dx, then that's the approximate probability that the variable will be between these two numbers. And then you could also have the joint probability, same interpretation. And then you have a mean, you have a variance, and a standard deviation, and then you could have a covariance, which is the measure of the degree of linear association between two uh, variables, in this case, two functions of random variables. Now, the thing is to think about this as uh, in pictures. So these are what you call as densities, okay? These are actually what you call as Gaussian or normal densities. This has a certain mean here, I think 40 in a certain standard deviation. The standard deviation is a measure of variability. It then the other one has a mean 40 also, but a larger standard deviation. And then the red one has a different mean. So that's how it affects the shape of the distribution. You could also have skew distributions, like if you're dealing with light times and so on and so forth, then you have a non-symmetric type of distribution and you get right skewed things there. Or uh, you could have joint distributions. So this is a bivariate distribution. That's actually what you call as a bivariate normal. It's like a mountain when you're dealing with two random variables. Of course, uh, we couldn't picture densities for three random variables anymore because that will be in four dimensional space. We could simply imagine that in that case, but the principles are the same in that situation. Now, what are the ways of uh, seeking truth from data? Okay, uh, there are basically several. One of them is what we call a significance testing. Okay, and uh, the idea in significance testing is that you have a model, you get data, and you say, is this data consistent with the model? Is it confirming that model? Okay, that's what you call a significance testing. And this was developed by Carl Person and Ronald Fisher in the early 1900s, okay? You also have what you call as hypothesis testing approach that were developed by Jersey Neiman, Egon Person. Here, what you have is you have two possibilities, and then you would like to decide based on the data which of these two possibilities is correct. Okay, of course, you could never be certain which one will be correct, but that's what you try to do. And then uh, you have what you call as decision theory developed by Abraham Wald in the 1940s to 1950s. And uh, this is the setting that uh, I'll show you a little bit because this is the more general setting that uh, includes both of these. And of course, you also have what you call as the Bayesian approach, which I'll also mention uh, later on. And this has gained uh, a lot of popularity recently because of computing technology, okay? It requires a lot of computations. So with the uh, advent of uh, high-speed computers and very powerful computers, we could now implement the Bayesian approach. And in fact, as I, I will mention later, the Bayesian approach is the right way to do updating, sequential updating, okay? Now, nowadays though, there's also another approach which we call as the algorithmic approach. And uh, a lot of machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence or modern data science methods are using this algorithmic approach uh, instead of the more classical approach. These are more uh, computing intensive type of procedures. Uh, uh, neural nets, uh, uh, deep learning, for instance, or SPM, uh, they are all using this algorithmic approach in that case. And uh, you could kind of think about the algorithmic approach as a non-parametric approach to seeking truth or knowledge uh, using data. Uh, but, uh, I will not emphasize this too much, that's for another talk, but I'll mention a little bit more about the earlier ones, okay? Now, these are other data-driven decision-making activities that we get involved in, okay? So you have what you call as A-B testing. This is very popular in Google, for instance, uh, or Facebook. Uh, you have precision or personalized medicine, which is trying to, uh, uh, determine the intervention that will be done on the basis of the data 
for each patient. So, you, so it's kind of precision medicine or personalized medicine. You could have prediction in forecasting. This could be say in the stock market or climate or weather prediction, classification discrimination, clustering into communities. I think I, I saw Xi Wen Shen. He was my former student at, uh, at uh, USC here and he's in uh, New York now, but his thesis was dealing with uh, clustering into communities in uh, uh, what you call as network models. You have recommender systems. Uh, if you open Facebook, let's say that uh, you have been searching for maybe a gardening tool. Okay, you wanted to buy a gardening tool. Then when you, next time you look at your Facebook account, suddenly there are pictures there of gardening tools. And you might say, how the heck are they doing that? That's all being done by these recommender systems. Okay, they're trying to make you buy a particular product and the theory behind that or the, the technology behind that is this recommender systems and those, these are all based on data. Segmentation in business, uh, the engineers uh, uses control systems in automated systems. And a lot of these are based on uh, the theories that uh, we have in uh, statistics or data science, machine learning, or artificial intelligence. Now, uh, where do you find the data, okay? Now, you could find data in many ways. Uh, it could be from scientific or engineering experiments. I think Raymond and Kay and Angeline they do a lot of scientific experiments or engineering experiments. Some of them are quite expensive, but the purpose is to get data. You could have designed scientific experiments or randomized clinical trials. Of course, uh, for those of you who are following the, the COVID-19 vaccine trials, this has been mentioned a lot because the randomized clinical trials are the gold standard, but uh, uh, sometimes it might not be possible to do that, but that's what we would like to do to actually determine if one treatment is better say than the placebo. Okay, you could obtain data from surveys, it could be political, social, or economic. You could obtain it from opinion polls, government monitoring, observational studies, if you couldn't do these controlled experiments, high throughput studies, like uh, my wife, Marge, uh, they do a lot of uh, omic studies, microarrays. So uh, they have this technology that produces so much data because uh, they examine every gene, for instance. Or you could obtain data from satellite and GPS systems or automated data gathering systems, uh, which usually generate big data. Think about uh, a nice Tesla car that is automated. Okay, how do you do that? There are sensors that's gathering so much data every millisecond maybe, and then that data is fed into the algorithms and then the algorithm decides whether to turn to stop or whatever. Okay, those are automated data gathering systems. And then the technology behind that is all about these uh, types of situations. Well, but there are many possibilities, but again, you need to be careful about the type of data that you are gathering because you could have data that are biased. You could have data that are too noisy. And if that's the situation, they might as well be useless for, for your purposes or it will lead you to the wrong conclusion. So, so there you need to be careful also, okay? They always need to examine that. And then there are many data types or structures. You could have the usual vector of numbers that uh, a lot of us have seen or characters or objects. You could have arrays of numbers like matrices, okay? Or you could have tensor data. Tensor data is kind of a, a higher dimensional matrix, okay? But uh, nowadays, these are getting considered in the statistical literature too. Uh, you could have many observations, okay? But a small number of features, okay? You would say large and small p. Or you could have uh, a large number of features, like maybe you have 23,000 genes, but you have only examined maybe a thousand patients. In that situation, you would say that you have a large p or very large p, a small or moderate sample size. Okay, this happens a lot now in the biological or the medical sciences. You could have time series data or spatial data in ecology or in a stock market, you could have this type of data. You could have network data now, okay? So as I said earlier, she ran uh, my former student work on this network data, or you could have survival in time to event data. This, has, this uh, topic has been my specialty in my research. Uh, I've done a lot of work on survival in event time data and uh, 
uh, we are still working on this, and then we have some new models that we're going to introduce uh, uh, on event time data, recurrent data, longitudinal marker, and then time to event data simultaneously. Okay, so now uh, you're going to have several concrete problems that uh, might be of interest to you uh, where you need to use data. So, and I put her uh, up you. So you could ask, who will win the electoral college vote? in the US presidential election this November. How do you go through that? How would you decide on that if you have, if you are being asked to determine that? Okay, and uh, that's where opinion polling comes in. Of course, it's actually much more complicated in the US because it's through the electoral college. Okay, so as compared to the Philippines where it's just a majority vote, okay? Or uh, you could, for instance, ask uh, maybe Joel Coelho is very much interested in this. What is the proportion of the population of voters in the Philippines with a favorable opinion of science? Okay, apparently it's quite low. It's also in the US. I think uh, from what I've read, it's only about 35% that has a positive opinion of science. You need to change that, okay? So you could ask the question, is hydroxychloroquine better than a placebo in treating COVID-19 patients? That's a problem that we have these days. How do you decide on that? Again, that requires data. On the average, do college graduates earn at least $20,000 per year over non-college graduates? Or is the 20,000 too high? Or maybe they're the same. So, so how do you decide on that? That requires data. Or a geologist might ask, what is the probability of a major earthquake in the Philippines next year? Now, that's a more complicated problem, okay? But how do you do that? Then again, you could get data. What is the best prediction of the number of COVID-19 deaths by the end of 2020 in the US? I'll mention a little bit about this in the end if I have time, okay? So, so those are concrete problems that uh, requires data to answer, okay? And uh, this is the type of problems that we have, but you could have other problems, whatever area you are doing, you could have. Uh, lots of problems that might be interest to you, but they all require data. Now, so how do we do this, okay? So on this slide, I put a kind of a schematic. I'm always impressed by the engineers when they give talks. Uh, they always have these nice pictures and flow charts, and I promised Kay that I'm going to uh, sketch some pictures here too. But this is how I review that, okay? The starting point is that you have this truth space, okay? This is where the truth resides. There are many possibilities. I call them a state, but that's a big question mark. You want to discover the truth. Sometimes you might be trying to discover a feature of this truth, so a function of data. So this is the one that you really want to discover. But there is an underlying truth, but you want to discover how. That could be the mean, or that could be the variance, or it could be the, the probability, or it could be uh, something else, okay, but uh, you want to discover this, okay? Now you have prior knowledge about the truth that is given by this distribution, which we call as pi theta, that's what you call as the prior knowledge. That is your subjective knowledge of what you think the truth is, okay? So it's a probabilistic one, okay? Now, uh, what you would like to do is to choose an action, okay? You have another set here. This is what you call as the action space. This is the choices for you and what you would like to do is to choose an action here that will try to coincide with what the truth is. So when you have a truth and you have an action, there's a loss that you will incur. Usually if the A here coincides with the tau, then you don't have any loss. But if the A is different from the tau, then you will incur a loss, okay? So, so the problem is to choose an A that will be close to the truth, whatever is the truth but there's a measure of the discrepancy of your action with what the truth is, okay? That's what you call as the loss. Now, but you know, you want to use data to, be, to make that decision. So what do you do? You do an experiment or you do a study or you observe data. The data is going to be denoted by X. That could be a complicated data, but I simply denote that by X. And it takes values in what you call as the sample space or the data space. And you will see one of these values uh, of this uh, observable, okay? And based on this uh, observed value, you then want to use that to choose the action that you'll be using, that you'll be using. Now, you choose that action by having what you call as a decision function, okay? So that will take this data 
into this function that will then give you the action that you are going to choose, okay? And this delta x is what we are trying to do. As a mathematical statistician, what we want to discover is what are the deltas that are good for making decisions, okay? This is our goal, to try to determine that. Now, uh, on this part here, you notice that I also put x given theta has a density f x theta. Now, th this is very important because what this indicates to you is that the experiment that you are doing is informative for theta in the sense that the data that you are going to see contains information about the truth. Because if the data that you're going to see doesn't contain information about the truth, then you have just wasted your time. You will not be using an informative data to choose your action. It's just like you are guessing. Okay, so, so that's the idea. So the truth, you wanted this, you want to choose an action through a decision function that uses the data and maybe you will use your prior information, prior knowledge. So that's the kind of picture of the decision-making process in that situation. And the question is, what is the best delta to utilize to decide to choose the action? Now, this one is for truth discovery where you are interested in this truth data or the Tahoe, but uh, you could also have the prediction problem. In the, in the prediction problem, it's very similar to the earlier one, except that you will be interested in another variable, which I called Y here, that depends on the truth, okay? So the data will govern the outcome of Y, but that's random. And then what you would like to do is to predict that Y. Again, you wanted to choose an action that will tend to be close to this Y, and the measure of the degree of closeness is going to be given by some loss function. Okay, and which is this. And again, what you would like to do is that you will see a data through this experiment uh, using an informative experiment. And then you would like to use this data that you see to put into this decision function to choose the action. Again, the question is, what should be the delta that you'll be using? This is the problem that we mathematical statistician try to figure out, okay? And we are looking for the best one or for good ones in that situation, okay? So that's the basic picture if you want to put it in a picture form. Okay, now you might ask, why do we need to do the best methods, okay? So let me drink my coffee here. Why, why do we need to have good methods or best methods? Now, if you're using the, the best uh, decision function here or here, okay? Then what it will do is that it will reduce the cost or the resource requirements, okay? So instead of uh, spending $10 million, maybe you'll be spending $5 million, okay? Or instead of using, uh, 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 requiring 100 people, maybe you're only using 50 people for the same outcome, okay? So you could have that reduction in number of units. Like uh, if you're doing mouse mice experiments, then instead of using 200 mice, you might only be using 100 mice if you're using good methods. You are able to make precise and accurate conclusions in decisions in a timely fashion, okay? Imagine, for instance, uh, trying to accelerate COVID-19 trials. If you have good methods, then you might be able to shorten that trial. So to be able to get to us. It's good for the environment. And we all say, we always say that uh, we want the loudest bang for the buck, okay? so. And that's efficiency. You want to be efficient. And uh, I put here, which one would you prefer? Would you prefer a car that takes four hours to reach your destination and consumes four gallon of gasoline? Or would you like a car that takes two hours to reach the destination and consumes two gallons of gasoline? Of course, you would like uh, this one because uh, you conserve uh, a lot of things. And that's the reason why we would like to choose the best delta. And uh, that's the problem that we had in mathematical statistics. What is the best decision function that we could utilize, okay? Now, uh, let me just go back a little bit to that problem of informative experiments, okay? I said earlier that the experiment is informative about the true theta if the observable x that you have has a distribution that depends on theta, okay? That's uh, the basic definition of an informative experiment in a stochastic or probabilistic sense. Now you could actually measure the amount of information in this X about theta by using the feature information. 
in the future information is simply the variance of the derivative of the logarithm of the density function. Okay, future is one of the pillars in the statistics and he developed this information in the 1920s. Okay, you could also use other information like Shannon's information or callback Klibler information. You could also have those, but this is a measure of the amount of information. And uh, the larger this is, the more information that observable has about this parameter theta. Now, here's a very simple example. If I flip a coin, a biased coin, okay, uh, with probability of head being theta, okay, and then I denote zero it tail, and then one it head, the probability mass function for this x is given by what we call as the Bernoulli mass function. It is theta if it is one, and then one minus theta if it is zero. So that's what you call as the Bernoulli uh, distribution. It's the simplest uh, distribution, discrete distribution that you could have aside from the trivial one. Now you could calculate the feature information for this by following this. And it turns out that this feature information based on one observation is one over theta times one minus theta. That is one over the variance of X. The larger the variance, the less information. The smaller the variance, the more information. And the least information for this is obtained if you have a fair coin. Because if you have a fair coin, then it's the hardest to predict in that situation. While if the coin has two heads, it's so simple. You just flip it once, you know exactly uh, that's going to be head in that situation. So the information there is infinite actually. But this is a measure of what you call as information. Now, I wanted to mention something that's very interesting about this, okay? And uh, I say, but beware of noise on information. So remember earlier, I'm going to flip a coin with probability theta of head. Now suppose that uh, uh, aside from, from flipping that coin, I flip also a fair coin, okay? So I flip that biased coin and then I flip a fair coin. What I'm going to do then is that uh, uh, if the outcome of this flip of the fair coin is a head, I will report the value of that first flip. If the outcome of the flip of the fair coin is a tail though, I will report to you the opposite of the outcome of the biased coin. I'm going to call X star to be the resulting observable, okay? Now, I could ask you, what is the information contained about theta from X star? That's the contaminated uh, observation. And it turns out that when you do this, X star, has completely no information about theta, okay? So it, the, the, the noise, the, the process of the, that I did here completely eliminated the information about theta. And I put here a uh, kind of a question for you. What is the relevance of this noise contamination in our contemporary times, okay? Where say Dr. Fauci would say masks are important. And then say President Trump says, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's like something like this. And, uh, and so uh, information or propaganda sometimes could completely annihilate the information that is contained in a otherwise informative uh, data point. Okay, so what I think about that, but this is just an illustration of the essence of information. Not every observation that you're going to see is informative. And we see that a lot these days with fake news. One of the things that we need to do is to try to determine what information something has. But that's a complicated thing to do, okay? So, but that, what I just wanted to do that. So, in the setting that I was considering earlier, okay, here or here, uh, we could define two important functions, okay? So, in this are the risk function, okay, which I denote by R theta for a decision function delta. And that risk function is nothing but the average loss you incurred by using a decision function delta. And that's the integral, that's the averaging out with respect to this density. And then if you take the average value of this risk with respect to the prior knowledge that you have, that is what you call as the base risk. So the risk function at a given theta for a given delta is the average loss that you incur uh, because the X there is a random thing, okay? So that's the average one. You want that to be small as much as possible. While the base risk 
you take into consideration where the prior, and then you aberrates out this, and then that will give you the base risk, okay? So risk function is the average loss, uh, and then the base risk is the average risk with respect to the prior knowledge. Okay, these are two functions that are important to us. Okay, now just to give you an example here. Okay, let's say that we're trying to determine uh, whether hydroxyl chloroquine is effective or not. Then you will have two statements here. Uh, one of them is uh, I denote that by H of zero that it is not effective. Maybe that's the status quo, okay, relative to the placebo. And then H1, which call us the alternative, is that it is effective relative to the placebo. So the truth space then is going to be theta zero, H of zero is true, in theta one, H of one is true. The action space from which you're going to choose your action will contain two elements, H zero decide for H of zero, or A1 decides for H1. So you're trying to decide which one you're going to choose here, uh, but of course you'll never know which one is the real truth here, but you want to decide that. Now, in this situation, you could have the following loss function. If theta zero in A0 coincides, then the loss is zero, or if theta one in A1. While if you get theta zero in A1 is your action, then you get a loss. This could be something else, by the way. They need that be equal. or if, uh, you, if the truth is theta zero and you take the action A1, you will also incur a loss. But here I simply put loss of one. So it's either zero loss or it is a loss of one. But you could actually put C zero here and then you could put C one if you wanted to have uh, different consequences for the two types of errors, okay? Now, uh, in this situation, you could have two types of errors. One of them is that you decide for A1 when the truth is theta zero, or the other one is that you decide for A zero when the truth is actually theta one. And those are the ones that leads to uh, a loss, the positive loss in that situation. And uh, I could ask you here, in your opinion, which one is a more serious type of error? Is the error of declaring that hydroxyl chloroquine is effective when it is not serious? Or is the error of declaring that hydroxyl chloroquine is not effective when in fact it is effective? Which one is a more serious error? Of course, it's possible that you also have side effects in this uh, hydroxyl chloroquine, but that's a decision problem that could be of interest. And uh, uh, in August 6, there was actually a paper that came out. Uh, this is kind of a controversial paper because uh, the way they concluded it from a statistical point of view, was kind of erroneous, but this was a, a paper that came out uh, uh, in August 6. Uh, uh, lots of uh, citations immediately for this particular paper, okay? But the essence of that paper is that you have the placebo group, and then you will have that uh, hydroxyl chloroquine group. What they did is they subjected M subjects, okay, to this uh, group, okay, randomized, of course, and then they observed if, uh, if it was successful or if it was a failure. And then X represents the total number of successes in this group. And then for the other group, the hydroxyl chloroquine, they subjected N people, I think about 800, 800 people each, and then they also observed its success or failure. And they denoted by Y the number of successes in that group. Okay, so, so the data that you are seeing will be X and then Y. The data space then will be the product space of zero to M and then zero to N. That's your uh, data space. And uh, if you denote by P1, the success rate for the placebo group and by P to the rate for H of C, then these are the probability functions. It's binomial probability function, binomial probability function. And then you are then trying to decide if P1 is at least equal to P2. So that means that hydroxyl chloroquine is not effective or if P1 uh, is smaller than or equal to P2. This is the case where the hydroxyl chloroquine group is better in that case. Okay, you, you're trying to decide between these two and then uh, the data that you will see is the X and the Y. And that's the basis of this particular paper, for instance, okay? And uh, you will usually have prior knowledge about P1 and P2 in there you will typically put independent priors on P1 and P2, okay? So 
And uh, when you look at the setting that we have, you will then have a decision function and that will take values A0 or A1, okay? Uh, A0 will be choose that uh, a hydroxyl chloroquine is not effective, and then A1 is that hydroxyl chloroquine is effective. You're trying to choose between this on the basis of this data. If you look at the risk function, it's actually quite simple because the risk function for a given decision function is simply the probability of a type one error uh, under that uh, decision function. If P1 is greater or equal to P2, and then it's the probability of a type two error if P1 is less than P2. So, so the risk is nothing but the probabilities of type one or type two error. And if you look at the base risk in that case, uh, then that's going to be the average, average of this risk function with respect to the prior that you had put on P1 and P2, okay? And it turns out that that is simply the sum of the average probability of type one and the average probability of a type two error. So those are the elements in that situation. Uh, here's another problem that uh, um, I, to illustrate that. Uh, uh, Mitchelson was trying to determine the speed of light. This was an experiment in 1879, okay? And uh, he had 100 observations, a very intricate experiment that he did in the Washington Monument. But these are the data that he was obtaining. That is in 10 to the six meter per second uh, thing. You notice, of course, that uh, you don't get the same value. The speed of light should be a constant, but you, you, you don't get the same value because when you take your observation, noise comes in into the observations. Okay, so you want to denoise to, to do that. That is the data that he has, and this is the histogram of these 100 data points. And uh, I think the center there is about 299.9 times 10 to the six meter per second. That's the, the speed of light is very close to that, but uh, you have this variability and that's because of the noise in the measurement, okay? Now, how do you put this in this framework? So you could take the loss function here as simply the square difference between the action and then the speed of light. And the action is simply a real number, okay? There's uh, the parameter, the theta will contain two things, the speed of light, and then the standard deviation associated with the error contamination. You could put a prior on theta, which could be normal, that's your prior belief. And then the observations will be X1 to up to X100, which will be equal to the speed of light plus an error contamination. That's why here you have this uh, variability. That's because of these epsilon i's. And uh, you typically would assume that that error contamination has mean zero in a standard deviation sigma. And then that is the sigma that goes in there. In the, most of the time you assume that that's normal, but you are not required to put a normal distribution in that. So the data that you see then will be the observations. And what you would like to do is to come up with a decision function that depends on X1, X2, up to X of 100, which will give you a real number, which will be your action, okay? And uh, when you look at the, the risk function for this decision function, you get a very interesting form. It is what you call as the bias or the variance of the decision function plus the square of the bias. The bias is the difference between the truth in the average value of your estimate. So, so you have here the bias plus the, vari ba ba the variance plus the bias square. That is the risk function. And uh, what you would like to do is to look for a delta that will make this small, okay? So, so that's the game that you have to play. And I put here just a, a simple one. I said, what if you consider linear combinations of the observations, okay? So just an, uh, kind of a linear combination of the 100 observations. What's the best one? Then you could uh, theoretically calculate the risk for this. And uh, when you do that, a very simple calculation, it gives you this risk function. And then these are the coefficients, okay? So if you want this to be minimized, what you need to do is to take bi to be one over n. And consequently, what will happen then is that the best decision function among these linear combinations of the observations is nothing but the sample mean that uh, most of us are using or have seen, okay? So the sample mean is the best among the linear combinations of these uh, 
type, okay? Now, I wanted to mention a little bit about bias invariance, okay? So when you have an unbiased uh, decision function, what it means is that on the average, you're on target. So the target's the red one, and then these are the possible outcomes of your decision function. And on the average, if it is equal to that red one, then you have unbiased one. Biased, on the other hand, is that you're off target. This is a biased decision function. You're not hitting on the average to target. You're kind of biased, okay? Well, that's why I call it bias. And then you also have the big variance. Big variance has lots of bias spread, okay? As compared to small variance. Small variance will have this. And typically what we would like is a decision function that is of this form, unbiased, small variance. But sometimes you could allow for bias. If you could, if you could uh, correct for the bias here, and then you have a small variability, that might be better off. Okay, so, so, but you would like to be in this form here. You don't want this, okay? Your decision function should not be in this uh, category. It should be on this two. Either this is the best or this one here, if you could control for that bias. So that's the idea behind what we call as the bias variance trade-off, which is very important in machine learning, uh, data science, artificial intelligence, in, in all of statistics, okay? So the next question that uh, I wanted to ask is, uh, what's the basis of deciding on your decision function? The first one is to try to minimize the risk, okay? But when you want to do that, you might need to restrict your class of decision functions in order for a minimizer to exist. I'll then illustrate. Uh, in possible ways of restricting is that you could impose the unbiasedness restriction, the one that I just showed, or you could have what you call as group invariance or symmetry considerations, okay? Uh, I will not uh, uh, mention this anymore because that's a more complicated notion. Or you could uh, put a maximum of the risk over a certain region of the truth space, okay? And then if you could uh, then minimize some those restrictions, then you have found a good decision function. In this idea in pictures, okay? Let's say that you have a decision function delta star, delta one, delta two, and delta three. And then these are the risk function. You notice that delta star has a risk function that is smaller than all the others. In that situation, you would say, delta star is what I'm looking for, okay? And if you properly restrict your decision function like the linear combination, you might be able to obtain the best one, okay? And then that's delta star there, okay? Now, so I, I, I put this uh, slide here because this is kind of interesting. You might ask, is the sample mean always the best one? Okay, because uh, that's what we use a lot in everything that uh, we do teach our basic statistics students. And the answer is no, it depends. If you have a uniform population, for instance, uh, it turns out that you could use what you call as the sample mid range, which is the average value of the two extreme values. And if you use the sample mid range, it's a lot better than the sample mean. So this is a simulation of the sample mean in the sample mid range under a uniform population. In the sample mid range is much, much better than the sample mean. So if you use the sample mean to try to estimate the center, you're sacrificing a lot of efficiency. Okay, you have to use something else. So, so the point that I wanted here is that it's not always the sample mean that is best for estimating the center of your population, okay? It depends on the population that you're considering, oops, okay? Now, so the question that comes up then here is, uh, how do we know if we actually get the best decision function? How do we do that, okay? So here's a simple one, okay? If a decision function achieves the lower bound of risks for its data, okay? Then it's got to be the best one because it is achieving the lowest bound. And what happens that we have this Kramer Rao information inequality? Rao is the one that I mentioned in the beginning, by the way, uh, which says the following that if you have an unbiased estimator or decision function for tau theta, that's the, means the average of delta is equal to tau theta, the variance of this delta x is bounded below by this, what you call as the Kramer Rao lower bound. And that is given by this. 
And this is the information, the feature information, okay? So if you could find a decision function that actually achieves this variance, then you know that that's the best one because you have achieved the lowest possibility. That's one possibility in which you could determine uh, the best one. Okay, well, that's what we call as the Kramer row information inequality. So another way of uh, uh, being certain though that you get the best one is this. Imagine that there is a function X, say S of X, we call that as a sufficient statistic such that for every decision function delta x, there is another one that depends on sx that has the same average value and such that the risk of this is smaller than or equal to the risk of delta, okay? Now, imagine further that there is only one such delta star x, sx. Then you know in that case that that's got to be the best one. And uh, Shiwen, I think, is in the audience. I always joke, in, uh, he was in my class, that if Shiwen is the only man in town, all the girls will say Shiwen is the handsomest of them all. Because there's only one, okay? There's only one to compare, and that is that one. And this is the situation here. If there's only one decision function that depends on SX, then it's got to be the best one, because you give me any other, I could improve by using this. Okay, and that's the essence of what we call as the Rao Blackwell theorem. Again, Rao, that uh, one that I mentioned in the very beginning, is uh, an originator of this theorem, and then Lehman Chiffy theorem, and it is related to what we call a sufficient incomplete statistics. Okay, so two ways in which you could determine that you have actually the best one. And these are very big theorems in mathematical statistics. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, kind of difficult to understand in the beginning. But uh, the essence of that is what I just mentioned to the end. Okay. Now, the other, the other possibility that I mentioned earlier is that, uh, so this is the truth space, and then there might be a region there that you say, I don't care here, I simply want to bound the rest. So you could bound by alpha, okay, on this part. And then what you want to do is to minimize on the other side. Okay, so in this situation, the delta star will be the best one because I bounded it here, but then it has the lowest risk on the other side, okay? In that situation, you would say that delta star is the best decision function too. And uh, this is the situation in hypothesis testing. In hypothesis testing, you subdivide the truth space into two parts, okay? And then uh, you're deciding between this part or this part, and then you have the decision function. Usually you would specify what we call as the level of significance, the alpha, okay, that you have. And then uh, uh, what you have there is that uh, if you have this situation and you're using the zero and loss function uh, among the decision functions uh, that bounds on that theta zero, the risk, the best one is given by this. Uh, this is what you call as the likelihood ratio, and that's given by this uh, function, okay? And uh, uh, this actually is the theory behind the p-test, the analysis of variance, the chi-square that uh, maybe some of you had used these procedures. This is the whole theory behind that, okay? And uh, this is what you call as the Neiman person theory, okay? I think uh, it must have been on the, other side, on the other slide, okay? But this is the, the best type of uh, decision function. Now, uh, the other possibility is you say, could we have a global criteria? for deciding on the decision function. And uh, there are two ways of doing that. One of them is what you call as the minimax principle. And the idea behind the minimax principle is you safeguard against the worst case scenario. So what you do is you maximize over theta, okay? For a given delta. And then you look for that delta that has the smallest maximum, okay? And that's pictured here. So this is the minimax principle. You have the decision functions, you have the risks, you look for the largest value for each of them. And then you look for the one that has the smallest maximum risk. If you could find that, that is what you call as your minimus, minimax decision rule. In the idea there is that you want to safeguard the worst possible case. There you wanted to safeguard against an opponent that is trying to beat you, okay? So like in a game, 
So uh, while the other principle that we use, if you have a global criteria is to use the base principle, in that case, you try to minimize the base risk, okay? In that case, you have the base risk, look for the delta that has the smallest possible base risk, okay? In that case, that will be the base decision function. And that is uh, kind of pictured here. You have two risks, okay? I simply put a uniform prior. So you look at the areas under these two risks, whoever has the smaller one will be the better one. And then if you could look for that delta star that has the smallest base risk among all of them, that is your base decision function. And that will be what you'll be using. So there are several ways to decide on what decision function to use, either using a global criteria or restricting the decision functions or restricting on a, cer a certain portion of the sample space, okay? Now, here's the, the base updating, okay? So if you uh, have the prior knowledge, pi theta, and then you observe data, you could update your knowledge by using base theorem. This is what you call a space theorem. What this does is uh, it combines your prior information with what the data is telling you according to this, okay? And so it's a hy hybridizing of the initial knowledge in the knowledge that you obtain from your data. And this uh, is uh, what you call as the posterior knowledge of data given the data X, okay? And uh, it turns out that uh, if you have this posterior uh, distribution, you could obtain the base decision function by simply minimizing this, okay? So for a given data, you use that, that's that one. Take the average value of the loss, look for the action that will minimize this uh, posterior base risk. That is your base decision function. Very simple formula, very simple prescription to find the best base decision function. But uh, you must be able to do this. In the, in the olden days, the difficulty is finding this posterior one because sometimes this is difficult but with computing technology, it's very easy now to do this computationally, so you are able to determine the base decision function, okay? And uh, I mentioned here, how does one obtain priors? Now, and that's a subjective thing. That's what you know about that parameter. So two people, Ray, Raymond here, uh, could have a different prior, and then K could have a different prior, because that, those are your subjective opinions, or your prior knowledge about what you're studying, okay? And the problem here is that different people could have different priors and there's the issue of subjectivity, okay? What happens though is that uh, even if two people have different priors, if you keep observing more and more data, that posterior distribution will converge to the truth, okay? So it doesn't matter in the beginning, but as you keep getting data, it will actually converge to the truth. And uh, there's the notion too, what you call as the least informative or the least favorable priors, okay? Uh, and uh, if you have a flip of a coin, and then theta is the probability of head, your least informative prior there is the one that's flat on theta. It has the least information. And it turns out usually that the base decision function under the least informative prior generally will coincide with the minimax decision function. So it looks that this is difficult to obtain, but if you could obtain the least favorable prior, you can obtain the base decision function, it turns out to be the minimax decision function. And there's some intuition there, but I don't have time to do that. I wanted to mention though, that base updating allows for sequential learning, the iterative process of experimentation, updating, and experimentation. And this is the idea behind the, the, the sequential updating. Again, this is the truth. You have the prior knowledge. You do an experiment that is informative. You get the data, okay? And then when you observe the data, you update your prior, you obtain a new distribution, which is the posterior, which now becomes your prior. And then you keep another, you do another experiment. And you cycle through this. And as I keep doing this, your posterior becomes better and better and it will converge to the truth. So the base formulation actually in a sequential way will lead you to the truth, provided that you 
keep you stick with the posterior as your new prior. If you keep changing your prior, maybe like what is happening with the government, then you will never reach the truth. But if you do the sequential updating, this will converge to what the truth is. It will converge to what you call as a degenerate distribution. Okay, so that's the idea behind base updating or sequential updating. Now let's see. I think I ran out of time here. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of mention this. This is similar to the previous problem that I mentioned earlier, uh, deciding between two groups. Okay, so. And uh, what you have is that two distributions, uh, these are actually binomials, and then uh, you have a likelihood ratio, okay? That's what I was mentioning earlier. And then this is the, this is the decision rule that uh, you usually use, okay? And then uh, I put power here, which is the reverse of that, the opposite of the risk. And uh, uh, you'd like the power to be high, and then the probability of type on error to be low. And then you're deciding on the cutoff value. And I say here, no free lunch, because uh, if you sacrifice one, then the other one will go up. If you sacrifice the other, then the other one goes up, okay? And uh, this is the significance approach that I was mentioning in the beginning, uh, Fisher's approach. And uh, you obtain her what you call as the P value, which is the probability of observing more extreme cases. Uh, here it's very small if you if you see at 22. Uh, and then this is the demon person world approach. Okay. I don't have the time to discuss, but uh, I have this long paper. You could look at that uh, uh, with regards to using this framework. Uh, and then uh, this is the demon person theorem that gives you the best possible decision function in this setting. Okay, this is actually the theory behind the uh, one that I mentioned earlier. So in the, in the implementation, so, so too much information here. And then this is the posterior updating. Depending on the, the number of red balls that you obtain, you could obtain the posterior distribution probability. And then you notice that it depends on where you are. It gives you a very good uh, uh, posterior updating in that case. That's using the, the base theorem, okay? Now, I just wanted to mention to end here the COVID-19 application that uh, we had uh, this is for the US data. And uh, this is the data that uh, we had until uh, September 13. Okay, this is the reported daily deaths from December 31 up to December, uh, September 13. Okay, those are the daily deaths in the US. These are cases. And uh, what you would like to do is to predict the number of deaths cumulative as well as, well as daily. And this is a model that we had using that framework. Okay. And uh, I, the paper is in the archive, so we deposit it there. Uh, and then this is the daily uh, predictions. Okay, the, the black ones here are the observed ones. Uh, the red ones here were the observed ones after uh, this cutoff. Uh, we use the data to predict this. You notice that we're kind of uh, within the window prediction. This is what you call as the confidence band. And uh, we are covering the uncertainty in that situation, except for these two. And these two points here were adjusted values by New York and New Jersey. So the model that we had looks quite okay in terms of predicting the number of deaths. And then this is the prediction for the cumulative deaths for October 1, okay? The red ones are the observed values after the data that we use. So you notice that uh, it's, uh, it's uh, tracking it well, and then this is what you call as the cone of uncertainty. Okay, as you as you go further away, you are more uncertain, but this is what you call as the confidence bound or the confidence interval or prediction interval. And the paper here actually is in uh, Kim Lieberman, Lota George, I think is in the audience. Then I'm not sure Ben in Taihu, okay? But uh, we put this uh, in the archive last August, okay? So we still have to make some changes uh, in the manuscript before submission. But I know this keeping track. In the prediction, uh, using data until 9.13, for the number of deaths on October 1 is 203,000. Uh, on the, now, September 1, uh, we had 183,000. Actually, the one using 9.13 is this one, okay? And you notice that uh, when we use more data, 
then the cone of uncertainty uh, becomes narrower because we are more certain. And so the prediction for October 1 is 207, 361 now. And this is the, 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 the cone of uncertainty. So, so but, uh, in some sense, this is an application of this kind of theory that we had developed, okay? And I think this is the last slide here. Uh, I just mentioned that uh, all of these are related to data science type things, okay? Uh, a lot of the theory behind data science are actually based on these theories in mathematical statistics. I leave you with a food for thought here, because in data science, you typically have very many features, but uh, I ask here, uh, is it better to keep gathering many, many features? Does it really improve your seeking of your knowledge, okay? What are the consequences of using features that are not important? What are the consequences of not including features that are actually important? In the key to the answer to this is that bias variance trade-off. It is not worthwhile to just keep getting and getting data or features. It might not help you in the end. Okay, so, so but those are topics that are very important in the foundation of data science methods. Okay, so, and uh, the, I think this is my last one. Big thanks to Kay and to Raymond for organizing this, to Pahasi for facilitating these webinars and for the scholar discussions. My current and former graduate students always makes me work harder to understand things. The Department of Statistics, uh, uh, NIH, and then the National Science Foundation. And of course, my wife and my little dog, because uh, they always help me with a lot of this, okay? So, so I, uh, I thought I'll put this uh, uh, slide here. I saw this on Facebook the other day. You might think that Facebook is just full of uh, fake news, but sometimes you get a gem. And I thought this was a nice gem, okay? It's a doodle on a Facebook post that I saw. And uh, it's about science and uh, the, the points that we should make science be more accessible to the public. And uh, this is the essence of, of the thing there. So, so it's, a, it's a nice little thing. But sorry, I exceeded time. I, I, I put a, a lot of things there, but I wanted to be as complete as possible in terms of introducing some of the principles that uh, we have. So, Ray? So. Right, well, thanks very much, Edsel. Uh, yeah, sorry again, I exceeded time. That's all right. Uh, Kay, Kay has had to leave because she's giving her own yeah. talk at yeah, 9 a.m. She, she mentioned that. Uh, yeah. I'll be taking over from here, and uh, my colleague, Aris Obando, who is also a PASA member, will be helping out with the YouTube stream because it takes two men to do the work of one, <laughs> uh, one smart woman. So I'll go through the yeah, first. Correct, yeah. It is correct. Yeah. <laughs> So we'll go through the first few questions. Uh, number one is from Angie Lau of De La Salle University. Instead of searching for truth, can similar approach be applied to detect lie or rampant fake news, for example? Well, you just, uh, that's a good point. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so of course lying or fake news is the opposite of truth, isn't it? Uh, so, no, that's a good point though, because the, the, the data that we are seeing, okay, is of course reflecting what the truth is, okay? So in that situation, I think if you are looking for fake news, you have to create a model, a probabilistic model for what fake news model is, okay? Like, uh, 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 because the whole idea is that the, the probability function distribution that we are using, uh, is containing is based on the truth, the parameters about the truth. So if you flip that, you say, I have a parameter data that represents fake news. Then you could create a model based on that parameter. And then the data that you are seeing is being compared to that distribution of fake news. So in a sense, in principle, it does. Yeah, you could, yeah. But you just have to alter the model. Now, the problem, of course, in science is, uh, uh, this is what we are interested in. When you do an experiment, your experiment reflects what you are trying to discover. Okay, so, so yeah, interesting question, yeah. But, um, Potentially, yes, yeah. Thank you for that. We'll move on to the next question. This one is by from Rafi Cabrera. 
also of De La Salle University. Uh, how should we handle truth when it changes over time or specific to individuals? Uh, for example, the uh -huh. of beauty, which was different in the 18th century from how it is now in the case of art, music, which is uh, which varies with people's tastes. And uh -huh. uh, would big data help define such abstract or subjective concepts? Well, uh, in that situation, your your parameter, the data that we had earlier, will now be dependent on time. Okay, so you could have also the situation where the parameter actually is time dependent. Maybe that's the case in the stock market. Actually, if you monitor, say, the Apple share price, uh, the truth there is it could actually be changing. So you have a you have a time dependent truth. Okay, and again, now. Uh, in that situation, you have to use a stochastic process model because now you have to tie it with the time time uh, axis. Okay, so uh, at any given time, the truth had changed, and you are reflecting that. Now, of course, one one of the questions there maybe is uh, how do we describe uh, the changes in the truth as time passes by? And that's a that's a stochastic process problem, but it's still the same framework. You could put it. In this context, except that your data is now dependent on time, and uh, and we, we have models for that too. Yeah, and uh, uh, Markov chain uh, models, or uh, it, actually even in the COVID thing, uh, you might say, what's the infection rate? What's the R not in the COVID problem? That changes over time too, because that depends on the interventions that the government or the people are doing. So maybe in the beginning. It was quite high, so the data is high there, but then it changes, it decreases as time passes by. So you want to adjust for the effect of time on the truth parameter in that situation. But the, the principle is the same. Uh, on any given time, you could get an experiment, you could get data, and you could estimate the value of the parameter at the time, but as time passes by, things change. Yeah, so, so, so that, but that's an interesting problem. The weather, climate, for instance, it's another situation where things depend on time. Okay, so 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 that's a that's a situation where it might be describing the setting that uh, that you have there. Uh, beauty, of course, is changing. The notion of beauty is changing. I think there has been some research on that. Uh, where uh, remember, uh, I'm not sure if you had seen this news uh, about uh, the golden ratio uh, that uh, if a face of a person satisfies the golden ratio, okay? Then that's the definition of beauty because the Greek, uh, in Greek mythology, a lot of the architecture satisfies this. So there has been some sociological studies on this. And it turns out that in Polynesia, that is not the case. That beauty is different from the golden ratio. So, so that's uh, one situation where the definition of truth is different, okay? So of course in science, uh, uh, we are usually looking for the absolute truths or the probabilistic truths, but they could still be changing over time as well. Good question. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Now, our next question is from Vince Daria, who sends greetings from down under. Yep, yep. How do you deal with outliers that can't be explained and uh, reduce the certainty and reduce certainty? Good question, yeah. Now there are two types of outliers, okay? There are outliers that are actually valid outliers. They could be outliers simply because the distribution that you're dealing with is heavy tail. Like if you have a Cauchy distribution. Cauchy distribution has a wider tail compared to the normal. And it doesn't actually have a mean in a variance. But if you take observations from this, once in a while, you get very large values. Those are valid observations, okay? Those are, and you should not be throwing them out. But there are outliers on the other hand that are simply because of measurement error or something was done. Like if you look at that data that I was, I was showing here, this one here, uh, these are obvious outliers. And uh, if you see that type of uh, outlier, you say, what happened there? there could be an explanation. In the explanation in this particular case is that adjustments were done in New York and New Jersey. I think they added something like uh, 
3,000 deaths on this one day, and then they added 2,700 deaths on this one day. And then the, the office that the method that we had, we still utilize this observation, uh, put them outside of the prediction region. <laughs> so, but uh, we, uh, the procedure actually did not, uh, did not eliminate this uh, data. It uh, used that, but it, it points out that something's really wrong with this in the reason for that is this. Now, in, uh, in the case of measurement error, okay, and, uh, I'll tell you a situation about this, uh, which, uh, which reflects uh, what could happen. Uh, my wife will uh, kill me after this talk, so despite the last time that you'll see me, okay? Uh, <laughs> when, when I put gas in my car, I always record the uh, mileage in the, the amount of gas that I put. The typical statistician, and my daughters are really ashamed of me, okay? When my daughters were in the car, they would snuck their heads under the chair because somebody might see them, their dad is recording the, recording these mileage every time. So I have a nice notebook. Actually, some of the data actually was just in a paper in jazz in the Journal of the American Statistical Association. But one day, I, I see this data, I was analyzing this data, Vince, and I said, this couldn't be, this data is really just out of uh, context, okay? So one of the data out of 200 observations. And then I look at this data, I said, who wrote this, okay? So, and it turns out that it was Mards who wrote this uh, data point there. Uh, and I don't, I don't know what happened. I think she forgot to record after she put gas into the car and then realized that she had forgotten. So she just put a random number in this data set. And of course it popped out. And uh, I said, you cannot, cannot do this. You're very untrustworthy. You couldn't be a statistician in this case. So, so that's the situation where you have what you call as measurement error, or when you have noisy data because uh, your wife put a random number into the data set. So, so be very careful with that. Uh, it could happen with graduate students, you know, with students. The students uh, were talking on the phone and then he was supposed to be observing a test tube. And then suddenly the observation is gone. And they said, oh, let me just put a number here. And it, statistics don't lie in that case. Because when you, when you look at the totality of the observations, those types of observations that are fake observations will actually show up. Okay, so that's, and then there you have to remove those data points because they do not contain information in that case. Yeah, so, but that's a good point. You have to be careful. Don't just throw out observations because those observations could actually contain information. You might have to downweight them in the analysis, but throwing them out could easily bias your results in that situation. So, but that's a, that's a good point. That's a, the outliers is a pest in the context of statistical inference. And we always try to be careful about that, but you have to examine it. I have to defend myself. <laughs> actually, <laughs> there was one point that actually was a, an outlier. So this is, the, this is one where we were still in Michigan, where actually it was a time when there was a blizzard and the, the car was driving it thought that the car was driving so slowly, but we were actually pushing it up the hill because it kept sliding down in the snow. And the mileage for that particular incident, we were actually able to point out came from the time that we were pushing the car and it was going up and down the hill and so on and so forth. So <laughs> no, that, that, was an ex that was an explainable one, explainable yeah. one. Uh, outline. I don't remember yeah. now. Yeah. 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 I do matter. forget, so sometimes I write random numbers. I thought I would not get caught. <laughs> Oh, uh, then in the, since Mars came in there, so I was serving as her statistician in one of her experiments, okay? Uh, and uh, one time she came to me and she said, uh, the, the results are not significant, okay? But it was very close to being significant. And uh, she said, uh, whispering and, uh, you know, wives uh, could be a little bit persuasive. She said, could I just uh, remove this... Uh, observation and if you remove this observation things will become significant and i said you couldn't bribe your husband so, <laughs> so. this was actually an experiment where we had one mouse that we predicted was going to die from the chemotherapy so the mice looked very sorry looking um for all intents and purposes had lost weight it just would not die <laughs> so, so everybody was making sure i didn't go to the mouse house to kill the mouse but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the perils of mouse experiments. Yeah, yeah, those are interesting situations. Yeah. So.
Okay, um, our next question is from Royat Posadas. It's a four part question. Um, in a set of groups, uh, say you have 18 groups, two of them are non normally distributed. Is it still valid to use parametric tests? So that's uh, part one of our string of questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, not that one. You have to be careful there. Yeah, because uh, uh, this is one of the things that we emphasize as statisticians. Uh, uh, Statistical procedures, their validity depends a lot on the assumptions that are imposed. Uh, like for the t-test, for instance, uh, the t-test is, uh, uh, especially for small samples, uh, the normality assumption is very critical. If you don't have that normality, uh, you might put a 5% level of significance, but that's not what you are achieving. Uh, so, so in that situation, it might be better to use non-parametric methods because uh, non-parametric methods are robust for uh, assumptions. Uh, it, they're typically less powerful, okay? But they are robust, they're valid in that case. But if you use a parametric test and then the assumptions are actually not satisfied, you are deceiving yourself in that situation. So now if the sample size is large, like you assume, you're using ANOVA or t-test, even if you don't have normality, things are acceptable in that situation. But for small sample sizes, you need to be very careful and uh, you might want to do a non-parametric test to, to do that and uh, maybe compare it with a parametric one. And uh, if they lead to two different answers, you have to stick with the non-parametric one because that's the more valid procedure. An example of a non-parametric procedure is simply using the sign of the values or it could be using the rankings, okay? Uh -huh. In that situation, uh, you have a valid procedure because uh, it covers all distributions, but you get, you get less sensitivity in that situation, but you have a valid one. Yeah. So. All right, thanks for that, Edsel. The, the next question from the same person is, uh, which is more appropriate to test for equal variances, uh, Bartlett's test or Levine's test? Uh, I can't remember now. Yeah, those are both tests, isn't it? Um, I usually use Bartlett, but I know that there's a, a difference between the two. Okay, so I need to check that. I haven't used it for quite some time now, so I I don't have that uh, automatically in my mind which one is the, the better one, but I've used both of them. Uh, I haven't used them for quite some time now, yeah. And maybe I'll, I'll throw in the last two questions uh, because they seem to be related. Which data transformation technique is the most powerful? And uh, when transformed data is still non-normally distributed, should I still use parametric tests? Yeah, again, the, again that's the issue there, Alba. Should you, should you simply use uh, uh, non-parametric procedures in that case? Of course, uh, there are many data transformations, the box cops transformation is one possibility. But uh, here's, the, here's the problem that you need to be careful about. Uh, when you make the transformation, uh, like, let's say the box cox is an exponential uh, transformation, when you say x to the alpha, uh, when you choose the alpha that you have, you typically use the data to choose that alpha. Now when you use the data, and then you use the data again for testing, you are double dipping. And uh, when you double dip in the data, that had that have that could have bad consequences because they're related. So so yeah, you need to be very careful there. Now, if you use a non-parametric procedure on the other hand, you don't have to do that double dipping. So, but we use that. Uh, you just have to be careful in adjusting for the transformation. Now, uh, sometimes there's transformation like the log transformation or the square transformation where you need to estimate the parameter of the transformation. In that case, that could be okay. But if you still do not have that uh, kind of normality, then uh, you might as well make use of the non parameter I think it is better to be safe than trying to force things there. Yeah. And a lot of data science methods actually are more non-parametric in nature as compared to, to being parametric. Yeah. But uh, some people there, George, for instance, could could answer the issues there. Yeah, so George Luther is from Georgetown. 
and he has more experience on uh, those types of things. Uh, but uh, but those are issues. I think double dipping or triple dipping uh, is something that uh, people don't realize too much. But when you do this double dipping or triple dipping, they could be very very dangerous because uh, you, you might you might lose information immediately because of the transformation that you had done. In fact, uh, in some papers that I published, I demonstrated this negative impact of uh, double dipping in, uh, in the context of model validation. I mean, very interesting papers. Uh, I think it is one with uh, uh, Immaculada Aban, who might be here. Yeah, so but, uh, it was part of her dissertation in the 1990s where we demonstrated that uh, if you do this double dipping, uh, information could suddenly disappear in you and you might what you might be using doesn't have any information when you are trying to do the model validation. It's complicated issues, uh, but, uh, but those are issues that are uh, studied well, yeah, and has big consequences. Now, uh, if Joel is still in the room, I, I think he wants to ask his question via audio. Joel, are you still with us? I think he left. Uh, Joel already left the room. All right, uh, Aris, do we have yeah. do we have any questions from from the YouTube channel? From the YouTube channel, uh, no questions uh, so far. All right, but uh, we can proceed with the questions uh, from the chat box. Okay, so the next one, uh, Zita Albasaya is is asking uh, in machine yes, learning. You know, I think Sita was my student when she was an undergraduate student. Oh, okay. So it's yeah, all in the family. Yeah. In machine learning, the most, family, yeah. most yeah, of the time, yeah. the assumptions of regression are violated. How far can we allow, can we allow this kind of violation? Machine learning methods are uh, quite interesting because uh, the, the way we usually tune uh, things, uh, is we typically split the, the data into two parts, the training and the test data. So you kind of separate things and then, uh, and then uh, uh, so you do the training and then you test it and you say, what's the appropriate uh, uh, spooting parameter for instance, okay? So, so it's actually kind of non-parametric uh, in that situation. Of course, a lot of times uh, uh, in, the, in machine learning, that's, uh, that's actually related to that question that I was asking here uh, in the end, uh, uh, what happens if uh, you, you don't use uh, features that you should be using in the regression model? What's the consequence of that? And the consequence of that is that you will get bias, uh, a lot of bias <clears throat> possibly. If you, if you don't use features that are supposed to be there, then you will get bias. But what happens if you use features that are actually not important? It also has a consequence. And the consequence of that is that it will, uh, uh, it will Im increase your variance. You get less precision. Okay, so, so there, there is no free lunch. Okay, so in the sense that uh, put features there that are not important for the model, then that will just blow up your variance. Why? Because you're estimating more parameters that are actually serious. Okay, so that's when you, you, you usually do regularization to, to, to correct for that. On the other hand, if you don't use features that are supposed to be there, okay, then you will be off target. So there's a question there of balancing, and that's where the uh, training test uh, approach uh, comes in, because uh, what you're trying to do there is to determine what variables should go in there, and then you train, and then you, try, you do that testing to see how good it is uh, for different values of the smoothing parameter. And uh, it's a little bit different from what we usually do in statistics, uh, but uh, this is now the approach that we do in data science or machine learning, where we had uh, the splitting of the data and then the uh, cross-validation, for instance, comes in and so on and so forth. But uh, I'm not sure if uh, Sita was asking if the model was supposed to be non-linear and then somebody's putting linear models, uh, uh, you, you should be able to detect if the assumed model is actually off through the residual analysis. Yeah. 
But there's okay. there's still a lot of foundational issues uh, in data science. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, in the National Science Foundation, this is one of the big uh, questions, big projects that uh, we are seeking proposals, uh, foundational issues uh, of data science methods. And I think uh, statisticians could have a big say on this because the 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 analytical properties of these uh, methods uh, could only be examined mathematically. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't uh, examine their properties uh, uh, through just computation. Uh, yeah, there should be some foundational mathematical analysis in these procedures. And uh, that is currently what is missing, I think, in a lot of the, the machine learning, data science methods, deep learning, neural nets, and it's a big area of research. All right, uh, thank you for that, Edsel. There's a, the next question is from JJ Joaquin of De La Salle University, who first says, thanks for an excellent and clear talk. And he has uh, two questions. First, you've defined the probability space in terms of truth space, but uh, this does not cohere with its standard Kolmogorov definition in terms of a possibility space. Uh, I wonder what if the definition is grounded in a more ob objective or realist conception of the nature of probability. No, it's actually it's actually Kolmogorov's. It's a, uh, in Kolmogorov is uh, Kolmogorov simply deals with the probability measure. Okay, so uh, uh, in this case, uh, Kolmogorov was simply dealing with uh, uh, how do you assign probabilities to subsets of the sample space? Okay, if you have to assign one and what are the properties of the probability function? Okay, so and uh, uh, so he puts it in an axiomatic way, where he starts with uh, three axioms or four axioms uh, uh, that the probability of the whole sample space <clears throat> should be one, that the probability of any event should be positive or non-negative, and then you have what you call as countable additivity, that if you have a sequence of uh, these joint events, then the probability of the union of those events is the sum of their individual probabilities. Those are the axioms of Kolmogorov, and it pertains to one probability function. Now, when we deal with statistics though, we are dealing with uh, a family of probability functions. Okay, so uh, for every theta here, that will coincide with a P theta. That's the probability function. But whatever that theta is, that P theta must satisfy Kolmogorov's axioms. Okay, so, so consider you have now a family of probability functions or distributions or measures. And then basically you are trying to determine that theta that corresponds to the truth. So you have these many probability measures. Those are what we call as the theories. You get data and you say, what's the truth? What is the probability measure that is governing that? So, so that's associated with one theta. So P theta is one probability measure, or you could also think about it this way. But they all must satisfy the Kolmogorov axioms in the sense that uh, they must satisfy all the consequences of Kolmogorov's axioms. Now, Kolmogorov doesn't uh, say anything about how you obtain your probabilities. Okay, it could be a frequentist uh, uh, justification, it could be a theoretical justification, or it could be a subjective justification of you, how you assign probabilities. Whatever, you ass whatever your method of assignment though, they must be consistent in the sense of satisfying the three axioms. So as long as you're consistent, it doesn't matter. It could be subjective uh, way, or it could be a frequentist manner of assigning probabilities, or it could be a theoretical manner, but they all must satisfy Kolmogorov's axioms of probabilities. Otherwise, everything breaks down. The thing in statistics that you have a family of these probability measures, not only one, okay, as compared to the probabilistic Kolmogorov axioms, you only have one probability measure. In statistics, you now have this family of probability measures, you want to pick the one that is governing the data that you are seeing. So that's the, the thing there. So in statistics, it's a bigger one, but each of them must satisfy the Kolmogorov condition. Right, and the second part of JJ's question, uh, second uh, is, uh, you seem to shift to a more subjective definition of probability 
in the decision exactly. theoretic definitions. Is there a bridging principle that, that links but, the objective and subjective probabilities? The subjective probability uh, here, okay. So this one is an objective part, okay. The, the probability measure that you have there will be an objective part, okay. The subjective probability is the prior knowledge that we put there, okay. Because the prior knowledge, as a, we were saying, if I give you a coin, I say, what do you think? Is this a fair coin? If I ask Cramon, being an engineer, he say, oh, this couldn't be completely symmetric. He, wouldn't, he might say, this is not fair. So you have your kind of prior knowledge about the fairness of this coin. Somebody on the other hand, it could be say Aristotle, okay? I ask him about this coin. Aristotle is more a philosopher like Aristotle. He might say, oh, that's got to be a fair coin. I would put a prior of 50, 50 in that situation. So now that's the subjective part, okay? The prior knowledge that we put uh, about the truth is actually subjective and they could be different for different people. But for an experiment on the other hand, whatever experiment you are performing, that will lead to a specific distribution. It depends of course on the experiment that you're doing. Uh, if I flip a coin 30 times and I count the number of heads, then that will lead to a binomial distribution. On the other hand, if I keep flipping the coin until I obtain 10 heads, that will give me a negative binomial distribution. So that will change the thing, but that's an objective probability. So the subjectivity is in this prior knowledge. And then when we get into that uh, the Asian uh, approach of learning, which is this, okay? So this is the subjective part, okay? But the experiment that we're doing will be an objective experiment that will lead to information, to a data that is informative. But what we, when we update the subjective knowledge, okay, with this data, then of course, this is still subjective in some sense, but it incorporates the objective information that we are getting from the experiment. So this, uh, so this will now become your new prior. Then you do your experiment, another experiment, or another person does another experiment, but now it is prior. And so this cycles through, so the sequence of posterior probabilities in some sense are actually subjective knowledge that emanates from the initial knowledge that we had imposed. But it is getting updated and updated by the data that we are getting from the sequence of experiments that people are doing. And that's the one that will converge to a degenerate distribution on the truth. Okay, whether theta zero or the probability measure that is governing the thing, it will convert. So, but this subjective, there's the part that is objective. That's a very good question. There's a, always the, uh, that uh, difference between subjectivity and objective uh, things there. But knowledge is subjective, or the knowledge that we think we know is actually subjective. All right, I think JJ may have some further uh, comments which are better discussed by email because they may take some time. But uh, we'll take our last question, which is from Giselle. Let me see, let me find that question in the chat box. Okay. Uh, Edsel, excellent, exciting sharing of your expertise, thanks. What is your conclusion on the efficacy of HCQ based on the randomized based, uh, what is that? that oh, yeah, it's just, not, yeah, there, yeah, there were trials, randomized there, trials. Yeah, there were three trials actually that, or three papers that were published about this. Uh, and I think the three papers, which were kind of controversial, uh, they didn't find significant results, but then uh, when they made her conclusion, they concluded that the uh, hydroxyl chloroquine is not effective. But uh, from a statistical point of view, you couldn't really make that conclusion that they are not effective. But it, what it is simply telling us that the data that we had so far seen is not sufficient to conclude that they are actually effective. But I think, uh, uh, I don't know why, how they concluded that or how the reviewers let it go, but those are the, those are the conclusions of that thing. But I think that's not the right conclusion from a statistical point of view. And let me explain this a, a little bit, okay? so. Uh, when you have two hypotheses, one is the null, and then the other is the alternative. The null hypothesis typically coincides with the status quo. 
and typically that will be that hydroxychloroquine is not better than placebo. The alternative on the other hand is the research hypothesis, and then that is that hydroxychloroquine is actually effective, okay? When we do a hypothesis test, a statistical test or a decision function, we control for the type one error probability. That's when you set say 0 0.05 as the maximum probability of a type one error. When you do that, you don't have control on your power or the probability of a type two error, unless you have decided properly in your sample, sample size, okay? So consequently, when you reject the null hypothesis based on your data, you could conclude that the alternative is right because you have control on the type one error probability. But if you don't reject the null hypothesis, you don't know anything about the chances that you have committed a type two error. In that situation then, you couldn't conclude that the null hypothesis is correct. And this is the situation, this hydroxyl chloroquine. I'm not a supporter, by the way, of either one. I wanted to see what is the truth in this case, but the three papers that came out, which were kind of controversial in the past uh, two months uh, or past month, I think, their conclusion was a little bit wrong from a statistical point of view, because they were saying that uh, they were not able to reject the null hypothesis. So they then concluded that hydroxychloroquine is not effective. That's not the right conclusion. You could only say that uh, the data does not yet support the potential conclusion that it is actually effective. Yeah. So, so it's a it's kind of inconclusive at this point. So, but I think lots of trials are being done. Uh, uh, it, uh, they will come to a definitive conclusion. Data is coming and the updating is happening. So we will eventually find what the truth is in that. Uh, of course, uh, uh, of course, it would not matter. If you get a vaccine, okay, the vaccine is what we need. Um, otherwise, we'll never reach uh, uh, our normal way of life without the vaccine. But, but uh, at the same time, the vaccine trials should be done properly because uh, if they are not done properly, then the trust of people and the effect efficacy of this vaccine will also go down. And uh, if say, if I don't trust that the vaccine was properly studied, I might not take the vaccine, okay? So, so you know, those are important considerations. That's why we need to put the trust in science uh, at a higher level again. We, uh, it, it's, a, it's an objective kind of science that uh, we want. Uh, so it's very important. Uh, I'll just end by reading a comment and message from Pasi President Giselle Concepcion. Edsel, we always thank uh, Bayes and you as scientists for moving evolutionary biology, phylogenetic science forward. In regard to chemistry and biochemistry, small molecule science, either we have the right structure or not definitively. And when we deal with complex biomolecular structures, we need to measure the probability of correctness of 3D structure unfolding. It all depends on the higher low resolution measurements from instrumentation and complexity of structure uh, is, and complexity is what we handle well using STAT. Now, uh, she also is suggesting perhaps uh, we can ask Kay to invite you again to give a talk uh, at your convenience on the controversial HCQ results. But uh, <laughs> I might not be the I might not be the right person for that. <laughs> all right. But um, well, that's about all we have time for this morning. I just want to end as Kay normally would by announcing next week's talk. So uh, if uh, Edsel, if you would please unshare your screen, oh, so, sure, I can, sure, yeah. so I can yeah, share yeah. the file that uh, that I'm supposed to show next. All right, so next week's talk is, uh, uh, next week we're gonna have a talk at this same time by Dr. Cherry Murray, uh, professor of physics at the University of Arizona. And the title of the talk is the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the Pandemic. And finally, of course, for those of you who are interested in past webinars, 
Uh, these are held every Friday at the same time and past webinars are on record. There's a YouTube channel where you can actually view uh, when it, whenever it's convenient for you, the 20 other lectures that we've had. So thank you once again, and thanks Edsel and Marge uh, as well for, for your anecdotes about <laughs> marital <laughs> statistics <laughs> in, in the blizzard. Uh, thank you everyone for staying with us and uh, for attending this event and uh, keep safe in the pandemic, everyone. Thanks. Okay, Goodbye. thank you. Thank you also for thank everyone that attended. Yeah, thank you, Arts. She went, I think. Uh, <laughs> Marcos. Uh, Taiho, Taiho Kim is actually there. Chichi is there, my former students. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye bye.